What we decided to to do is uh, not to ask Jack to give a lecture because we've been reading his books. Um, so we decided to ask him some questions. Um, and each of the members of the class have, uh, are supposed to have uh, prepared a question. I prepared a couple of questions myself. Um, and we can, uh, I think I've got 20 copies here of two of our questions. My questions and Dean's are, it looks like they're typed together. Um, and you have another question there to hand out, Doug? Or? Oh, I, I don't have to hand out. You don't have to hand it out. Okay, well, here's a... So we won't start with my question. Uh, start with the second page, I guess. Dean, you want to start with your question? Sure. Uh, I made a sort of a bridge version because it ended up being a bit long because I kind of tend to be a bit long-winded. Like I'll read the one that I have. Something to write on the back of. Just, just even a couple of... Just one second. I yeah. just realized I don't have anything to write on. I can write in the back of this or this. No, I can't. This is both sides. Is that enough? Is this? <laughs> it's a tight Take budget up here. <laughs> <laughs> there is a tight I'll write on the back of it. Can I have another copy of this? Sure. I'll, Give me another copy. I'll keep one clean and I'll write in the back of the other one. Do you have any more? There's one right there, I think. There you go. Okay. There, that's, I'm good. That's good. Okay. When you said long question, I decided I better I need some notes. Okay. So um, actually, the, the back question is the one I'd want to start with. But like I said, I'll I'll read the one I have here because it's a bit shorter. So. So probably this. Um. No. So my question comes from the insistence of God, which you're which we're reading now. Um, in your chapter on Jijic, uh, you talk about his politics amounts to allowing capitalism to collapse under its own weight. So if you know all the dialectical cues, you can sit by and wait for the collapse while ignoring the material needs of specific immediate neighbors. Um, and since Zizek can't expect Paul's parousia, his messianism results in a kind of quietism for particular persons in the hope that the system will self-destruct. So to this you reply, there's no guarantee that what follows capitalism will not be worse, uh, alter capitalism. So you're worried about Zizek ignoring the least of these and that the event he hopes for can more readily actualize the threat rather than the promise of the perhaps even developing. So you write, when I read philosophers saying such things, I think there's more good advice about the political order in any randomly chosen edition of the editorial pages of the New York Times than is dreamt of by the philosophers. They howl at the moon of the revolution while in the meantime the right wing takes over everything. So as you know, you and Zizek are closer than it may seem. Uh, in one sense, Zizek's Holy Spirit mirrors your notion of the insistence of God. So God only exists insofar as we actualize God here and now uh, in the struggle for justice. But you reject the idea that the Holy Spirit is the idealist spirit of communism, which is a bit too determinate. Instead, a theology that perhaps has a materialism which is found, as you say, in cups of cold water given in fidelity to faces, not divining the dialectic. But is there a sense in which this, too, is a certain quietism that fails to change the actually existing material conditions proliferated by capitalism, which we know are often the root cause of the wayfaring strangers needing a cup of cold water in the first place? Acknowledging the face of the other is a move I fully affirm, but how does the theology of the perhaps, which doesn't rely on a determinate Holy Spirit, give us a point from which we might actually work toward radically changing our present material conditions structurally? So your notion of the event, the kernel of radical theology, seems to lend to a more revolutionary than a reformist position. But in dialogue with Zizek, you appear to defend the opposite, the reformist view that aims to work within the structures that be rather than to surprise them. So to put my worry bluntly, are you potentially howling at the moon of justice while in the meantime neoliberalism takes over everything? Okay, very good. Um. Let me just say, that just as a preamble, that the record of the Holy Spirit intervening on our behalf is so bad that you wonder why people keep bringing it up. Um, the Holy Spirit, you know, I don't take to be an effective metaphysical force. I think that's a mystification. 
Zizek's uh, conclusion to the parallax gap is sort of not, not going to be backwards off my chair and you know, left me on the floor. I mean, I, it's Bartleby. After all of that, after all of the bluster, all of the brilliant analyses and all the movies I had to go see, uh, um, we get Bartleby. Wait for the, I mean, the, the most classical Marxism, you know, waiting for the no labor unions so that we don't appease a terrible system and end up making it stronger and wait. And that seems to me just to be a position that's difficult to defend, and I can't imagine anyone defending it, actually. Um, is Jack loud enough? Uh, yeah, is that okay? Are we, you're right. So, um, the, mo the model of, of uh, Martha in the uh, existence of God is, is meant to be a model of action, of response, of taking action. Um, now, it, it, it just, and it's a model that's a model after the, uh, the event. Right? Now, uh, I, I mean, it just might be that the event would present itself in such a situation that something of a revolutionary character might happen. That, that revolution might turn out to be terrible, make things worse, and get us right back to where we started well, when we started the re revolution, except now it's worse, which is we, we see happening in uh, the Middle East. We're overthrowing terrible regimes to re end up reinstating even more terrible regimes. Which is not to say that you don't occasionally want the occasional revolution if you, the moment is right. What I, what I think is, Derrida at one point asks, where do we begin? And he says, we begin where we are. And um, so I try to think about situations in which things happen and, and things are transformed. Um, and we just have been, we're celebrating now the 50th anniversary of the civil rights movement in the United States, and we just celebrated the uh, march across the bridge in Selma, and we celebrated a, little, a few weeks before that Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. So Rosa Parks, I take the case of Rosa Parks. I think that's a good example. Um, as as teachers yourselves, I'm sure you know you only choose examples that support your point, so, and and you avoid the ones that don't. Um, Rosa Parks refuses to go to the back of the bus when she's asked to give her seat to a white person. Um, and as Leotard, what Leotard would say is that links. It linked. You know, it, it caused uh, first a widespread, it triggered, was the catalyst for a widespread uh, bus strike in Montgomery. And that led to uh, an even wider uh, moment in the, in the civil rights movement, which consisted in getting this relatively unknown pastor down on Dexter Street, who was interested in these things, to see if he would take over this, this wider movement, and his name is Martin Luther King, Jr. And now, Rosa Parks had refused to sit in the back of the bus ten times before that. A thousand other black people had refused to sit in the back of the bus before that. But what she did from in, in, in insistently within the system in which he found herself, we begin where we are, was be in the right place at the right time and do the right thing. Could have been the right thing at the wrong time. It could have been the right thing at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's the right thing at the right place at the right time. And that linked, it, that co pulled a string in a web of, of social and political and cultural and historical conditions that linked and that actually was a string that was going right into the center of the of the knot and produced a reaction. Now, and a thousand other or a hundred thousand other similar attempts did nothing. They just got beat up or killed or whatever happened to the people who resisted before that. So it seems to me that um, action, m more often than not, consists in interventions. That the we can't make events happen. Events happen to us. Right? 
and events are the coming of what we can't see coming. But we can't make them happen. But what we can do is provide for the conditions to let them happen and do uh, for, to sort of facilitate in their possibility in, in making them possible. Um, and that, it seems to me, consists in intervention. This is the same root of event, of coming. Coming between, intervening in, insinuating yourself inside uh, a system. Very often when we have massive, large, transforming, revolutionary changes, it's a disaster. You know, Marxism has never recovered from the various attempts that have been made in its name to produce revolutionary change. In each case, it produced a monster. Right? There's a monster on the left and a monsters on the right. The post-structuralist movement of Derrida and all these guys was spawned in 1968 when they said, enough Marxist leftist uh, revolutionary transformation. What that gives you is Stalin. What that gives you is the, the totalitarianism of the left. That doesn't mean that there aren't moments when a revolutionary sit-down you know, a, 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 a strike, a, 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 a Gandhi, when you can't strike large. But whatever you do, you do something, you know, you strike large or you intervene. I think for the most part, changes come from interventions. And, you know, Ronald Reagan did not realize how utterly he was going to corrupt the United States, how thoroughly he transformed it into a greedy, acquisitive, xenophobic, homophobic, aggressive, militaristic, mean-spirited place. <laughs> he, he didn't think he could do that much, but he did. He was, he was successful beyond his dreams. and he, he, he pulled a string. He said, you know, America's made up of welfare queens. Welfare queens. And that struck a chord. Barry Goldwater, 15 years before that, tried the same thing, and he lost he lost 49 of the 50 states. He was laughed off the, the, the street. Ronald Reagan said the right thing at the right time, or the wrong thing, <laughs> <laughs> and changed the world in a way that he couldn't have imagined. He wasn't smart enough to imagine what he, what he was going to do. And so I think change comes from strategic intervention, as often as not, more often than not. Either way is risky business. You may set off a disaster either way. Um, I'm not denying the, 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 that the opportunity, the eventive situation might present itself in which revolutionary change could occur. And it might just, in the days of the Internet, be set off you know, in a moment, in a flash. But for the most part, I think effective change, real change, alters things. And it's relentlessly altering. It's water dripping on a rock. It's constant intervention. Um, either of those possibilities seem to be better than what he's talking about. I mean, what is he talking That's crazy ideology. I mean, it's crazy talking. You know, he goes around spending all this time talking about the, the menace and the of the big other that we believe in. And what's he believe in? He believes in the big other. He thinks the wheels of revolutionary history are going to, you know, that the, 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 the world historical spirit is going to take the wheels of history in its hand and eventually crush capitalism just so as long as we stay out of its way. I mean, you might as well believe in devils battling with angels, you know, and, and Jesus comes and clears the air of the angels so we can all, uh, of the devil, so we can all rise to heaven. I mean, this is utterly mythological thinking, I think. But what did you think of it? Well, I, uh, I appreciate your response. I, I mean, I share kind of your, both, I guess, your sympathies and worries with Zizek. Um I think I had trouble parsing out you know, the attraction of Zizek is you get a certain attention to structural problems, right? That's why he's right. such an attractive person. It lets you get a handle conceptually on what's happening around you, right? And um, So I guess I was trying to find in the theology of perhaps, which is sort of a certain alternative to what you characterize as a strong theology in Zizek, 
uh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what would be the kind of resources that you would take to understand these kind of structural problems in addition to having sensitivity to, you know, immediate other person. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I certainly don't think, by the way, because you made some reference to neoliberalism, I, I do not think in term of, of terms of liberal subjects, which is another piece of confusion of Zizek about me. Uh, I mean, he didn't read The Weakness of God. He read, the, after the death of God, he read the interview in After the Death of God. He seized on one paragraph in that interview um, and uh, got me mixed up with Vadimo a couple of different times and quoted said he was quoting many of his voting body mo in, in the original text, but Columbia University Press made me strike it. I said, I guess all Italian names sound alike to him. And, <laughs> and he said, they said, well, that sounds sort of mean. And t- so I took that one out. Um, so it was, care- it was a careless reading of me. It does not associate, you know, I, I have nothing to do with neoliberalism. And my notion of the alteration, the mutation uh, of conditions, social, social political conditions, does not depend upon liberal subjects. It depends upon notions of systems, inter, interwoven networks of things in which we intervene within them so that individuals are like nodules within uh, a woven fabric, points where the threads cross. And if you can pull the right thread at the right time in the right way, you can shift things around. Um, and if you keep the system off guard so that the, the coming of something that you didn't see coming, which is usually the way things happen, something comes along that you didn't see coming, will be uh, disposed for its open to it. It'll strike the right chord at the right time. And it's what Hegel calls, in a metaphysical way, the Geist. You know, it, it's somebody says the right thing at the right time, and it it, res- it, it interlinks across a, an interstitial lateral system, I think. Yeah, thanks. I, I like that response. That's helpful. Yeah, I'm, I've, I have a new book coming out from Fortress that, uh, in which I talk about interventionalism, which is because, you know, I, I, I do create sometimes among uh, people who have, but, but among Zizekians, let me just put it that way. That impression, and, and it's because of him. I mean, he's he's you know he's a uh, star. You know, he's 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 Elvis this nowadays. He's Elvis, and um, he is he is. I mean, you you have a conference here at ICS. <laughs> Invite Zizek. You know, you'll need the auditorium for a thousand people, and people will show up with Zizek T-shirts. Um, so I need to say something about that. Because he's got two, when he speaks, it's with a, you know, a, a great magnifying voice, magnification of his sound. And so it goes all over the place. Okay. If I go on too long, by the way, just stop me, because you've got a, a number of questions you want to go through. Chris, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Did you, did you uh, make a few copies of it? I don't have this many. But oh, give us a few. So, so I'll actually start with the second one. Um, I, um, I have to say, I was really, I was really taken by the by the description and the weakness of God of of. Uh, the account of creation. Um, that was something that really spoke to me. Um, I've been thinking about it ever since I read it for the first time. Hats off to Catherine Keller, who was who sort of helped me out with that one. Um, and um, so I, I've been kind of thinking of it as a, a, as a practical matter. Um, so um, how, do you, how do you preach God as a weak force um, on a Sunday morning, for example? Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of... of Dealing with texts that really do speak to the power of God, so how do I how do I preach Easter from position of God as a weak force? Um, and then on the other hand, how do I preach um, how do I preach in a situation where people are really actually craving that strong force of God? How do I preach a burial um, and claim that God is a weak force um, when people are actually 
sort of seeking out um, the strong power of God in those moments. Yeah. I don't, th- I don't think it's in the insistence of God. I think it's in this coming book. And also, it's in an essay that I uh, just wrote for a, a group of uh, people called the Shel- Shelter 50. It's a new organization out in uh, the Midwest in which they're provi- basically providing a center for peace and justice uh, meetings, and they really do provide shelter for the homeless. And so they wanted to create a book that they put the proceeds from which would help to fund this operation. And they asked me to write a lead essay, then they got a bunch of people to just react to it. You know, some people were academic, some people were musicians, some people were poets, and a lot of different. So um, uh, I wrote a, uh, an essay on the, the spectrality of God, and one of the sections of it was, and I kept saying, God, God haunts us. You know, God, God said there was something spooky about that. And one of the sections, the last section actually, is called, It Spooks, But Does It Preach? So, your question. Um, let me give you an example of an answer. Um, I uh, um, met a young uh, pastor who was a uh, hospital chaplain. And he said that, uh, he said, it's a kind of job that you can only do so long because it's basically you're going to visiting people who are dying uh, almost every day. And um, and talking to their family, and he said that the job is just destroying them. You know that it's so punishing. And he said he is now at the point where he is just simply not going to repeat the the usual stuff. He said he's not going to tell people about the heavenly banquet who are on a feeding tube or who have just been taken off from. And he's not uh, going to promise them uh, eternal life. He said he thinks his work as a hospital chaplain is to be there with them and spend the night with them and make sure they're not alone and talk. Baggage. And uh, and he said to me, "That's what I think the weakness of God is." And I said, "Yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly what I think it is." Um, I, I th- you, you you have to take the wh- what I think is the heart of the kingdom of God out of the economy in which it's, you know, this for that, quid per quo. Be good, be good in this life and give up uh, some things you'd like to do because you'll be happy. It pays infinite dividends in the long run. You've got to take it out of that context and present it in its own intrinsic, value-free uh, worth so that God is not somebody who comes along and saves us. God is not somebody who raises us from the dead because we don't want to die. You know, where, you know, I was just reading a commentary on the parable of the uh, 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 particle son, and uh, I was struck by the line where, when the particle son comes home, he says, and the father says, "My son was dead and now lives." That's resurrection. When a child who has spurned his parents comes home, that's resurrection. My child who was dead is now uh, alive. Resurrection is the is the resuscitation of our lives. It's 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 uh, it's it's living through the worst nightmares and coming out the other end. Um, it's you know, it's take take Matthew twenty five, and you have that, that little kernel there. This you know the very essence of the, the kingdom of God. Lord, when do we see you hungry, and when do we see you naked? Inserted within this 
terrifying story of the return of the Son of Man who's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And if you don't, if you didn't clothe the Lord when he was naked, you're going to pay with unspeakable torment for all eternity. God will stand up there with his arms closed on unaffected by your misery. So this magnificent story is, di is distorted by a, a horrific context of this horrific context in which if you love me, I'll show you into the kingdom. If you don't, you, you'll, wish you were, you'll wish you could die and you won't be able to. So I don't see how you could preach with that stuff, frankly. It seems to me that preaching, when you relieve the, econ the, the kingdom of God of that economic talk and the magic of resuscitation, uh, I don't see how you could sell that. That's snake oil. What preaches, it seems to me, is that the core of Matthew 15. What preaches is, you know, like the story of Jesus uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the fourth gospel about the resurrection of Lazarus, in the commentary I gave on it in weakness. You know, the cynical, whoever the cynical guy was who wrote the fourth gospel, has Jesus wait until he's sure that Lazarus is good and dead so that he can come in there and do his stuff. Right. Now, is there an historical tradition behind that? Almost n no chance. Right. It's the only place that has got no m multiple attestation. Nobody else knows the story. It's, it's clearly gosp the gospel of the, whoever wrote the fourth gospel. But I think, well, you know, maybe there's... Imagine that there could be an historical tradition behind it. And what would that be? Well, first of all, Jesus finds out that Lazarus is, is dead. His sisters, his friends, brother is, is dying. I mean, not dead, but dying. He rushes as fast as he can to get there, and he's too late. And then he spends the night with Mary and Martha, and they talk, and they tell stories about their dead brother. And the sun comes up, and somehow or another, the sisters are able to get through the day in a way that they wouldn't have if Jesus just hadn't been there for them. That's resurrection. So I think the weakness of God really is the only thing that preaches. And I think the other stuff is snicker. It's Elmer Gantry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask my question now because if you come... It's a kind of a long question. I think I gave you a copy of that, Jack. All right. Because it's, uh, you might think what I'm going to say is magic, too, so so we'll have to uh, look at that. Did you, have you, most of you got a copy? Yes. Um, as you say on page uh, 62 of insistence, maybe it's, I don't even think it's 62. Maybe it is. Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, radical theology is confessional theology confessing perhaps. That is, a theology without theology, an impossible haunting theology showing up as an historical, perhaps, confessing theology of the spook, spirit event. I like that very much. I like that uh, way, and uh, that's why I consider myself kind of a twin. My questions, however, and, and you will uh, realize, Jack, that this is a, it turns out to be a, a refrain that we've uh, played before. My questions, however, start with what you emphasize at the end of insistence. Perhaps is older than God. To be true to your emphasis on ambiguity and undecidability, I would argue you need to add a phrase. Perhaps is older than God. Perhaps not. 
reading that perhaps is older than God gives the impression that that's the way it finally is. But, in fact, is not that your construal, your hypothesis? As you point out a few pages earlier, when we say ultimate, we are usually confessing the limits of our imagination. Ultimate just means that we have reached our limits, the outer reaches of our present horizon. Or as Derrida said in Memoirs of the Blind, I don't know, one has to believe. That is to say, your confession is that perhaps is the non-originary origin which is the more radically neutral, clears the space for the chance of grace, but equally for the chance of disaster. So the emphasis is on it's equally a chance for disaster as it is for grace. Thus, in every one of your books that I've noticed, after extolling the virtues of faith in which someone stands with those who suffer, you place the mercilessness of Nietzsche's disastrous view of the anonymity of the cosmos that four and a half billion years from now the call of justice will have sunk into oblivion, that no one is there. In radical hermeneutics, it's the choice between the religious and the tragic. Um, in Against Ethics, you say that you're uh, haunted at night by Nietzsche's... Uh, vision of the disaster. For me, I read that to mean that the chance of grace is totally a matter of chance, random, impersonal, iffy, to say the least, if you could even call it grace. Perhaps, moreover, as a result of perhaps being older than God, God is, you maintain, not eternal, but contingent. All this makes me wonder. Now my alternative uh, look at it. However, if love is the energy, glue, eminently firing the universe, love is my name for God to distinguish the God self from a supreme transcendent being who's had a good run, as you say in one of your books. <laughs> If love is older than perhaps, then, although life remains a risk and is chancy, it is a beautiful risk because love is stronger than death and somehow, some way, I don't know how, grace will surprise us and embrace us. Then, although the when and the how remain unknown, there is no if the gift of grace will visit us and embrace us. There is a little bit of an if. Uh, provided we are open to being spooked, surprised by love, even in the midst of death. I want to turn the spooking into a positive as well as a, a, a negative thing. This makes me also want to look for some way beyond the necessary contingent binary for God. To be the God of love is to be the creator because love is self-giving, going out to the other for the sake of the other. And to be the God of love is to be a covenantal God who dwells in and with all the family of creatures in the creation. God's presence is the gifting of to life in the here and now. And simultaneously, God's presence is the calling of and to life. Along these lines, the creation is gifted, charged, not saturated, um, which is what John Luc Marion talks about, is charged with love, while simultaneously it is, in, it is called to dispense, discharge love. Answering the call is to receive the gift. The two sides belong inextricably together. And now my... Um, more radical no note than Jack's. <laughs> Indeed, so spooked by the life power of love that I will venture in hope to say death, perhaps. In other words, some way, somehow, our horizons as we know them will be shattered and transformed. 
with an event. And life will continue in some form or another in a new heavens and new earth. For that is what love is and will be forevermore. God with us, for us, and ahead of us. That, I submit, is not postmodernism light. Um, Marl Westfall. Or a kind of fideism. But so open and exposed, so radical, so impossible, that nothing, even death, can separate us from the love of God. Um, and before I ask Jack to respond, one little footnote. Jack and I have had a long-running discussion whether the perhaps, which is another word for Cora, is neutral, cold, indifferent, anonymous, or amorous, womb-like, and warm. So, Jack, I was pleased and surprised when you write that although the perhaps is radically neutral, he suddenly interjects although it constantly virgins, verges on becoming uterine, like a womb, a primal place in which from existence emerge. Almost warm. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you can do it. No, not so. Uh, this is an ancient and venerable uh, debate. <laughs> This is at least 20, 25 years old, you count me. <laughs> Maybe we could be buried in the same cemetery and we will continue the debate. <laughs> okay, when I say, um, it, it, thank you, it is a pleasure to have such close, close reading. I can't imagine anyone who could give me a closer reading than, than you. Um, when I say per perhaps it's older than God, what I should have said to defend myself against this, uh, your, what your, uh, point, the point you're pressing, uh, is older than, uh, you notice I will very often say, instead of saying God, I'll say the name, and in parentheses, of, and then the word God in quotes. So if I say perhaps it's older than the name of, God, then it is older, because wh what we what we know, you know, what we have reasonable um, grounds to think is that we are uh, a moment in a universe that is to the best we, they can tell us right now, fourteen point eight billion years old, um, in a little. A solar system in a galaxy in, in uh, a universe that's heading for well we don't know what I mean the, the that dominant right. theory is <laughs> that it's heading for entro entropic dissipation but they just discovered a vast black hole exactly which lends support to the other theory which is uh, this this man Paul Steinhardt at uh, uh, Princeton um, wrote a book called Endless Universes, and he said that it just, it's just not good physics for him to start talking about uh, matter coming out of nothing or returning to nothing. So it's just, you know, he, this is not physics, he thinks it's uh, some kind of... Uh, snake oil. Snake oil, yeah, <laughs> philosophical power, speculation about physics. And um, he has a, another account in which well, in, in which there's the universe is spawned and the universe is forever. I mean, the, the, the details of it I don't understand, but I, I do know more than, I can explain more than that, but it would take more time. Um, so maybe that, that'll be the case. Leotard uh, gives another version of the same story, which I use uh, in the, the forthcoming book, in which he talks about this expansion of the sun. Uh, which will, between 500 million and a billion years from now, turn the Earth into toast. And um, I wanted to um, email N.T. Wright to see if he would answer me, um, because he says, you know, when the first Thessalonians, where Jesus comes down on a cloud, we all get it wrong. 
Jesus comes down on a cloud and the graves open up and the faithful are raised up to the, those who are still living are raised up to the cloud. Uh, he says that it doesn't go back up to heaven. He comes down to earth and establishes the rule of God on earth. The kingdom of God is that what Jesus was expecting, what the New Testament was expecting, what the Jews were expecting was that God would establish his rule on earth. And um, so I wanted to email him and say, well, God's rule has got about 500,000 years to go, and it's going to get awful warm around here. So what we, so what we know is that here we are in, this, in the midst of this uh, world, and we, we are something not uh, less than matter, but we are some magnificent uh, involuting and in, uh, enfolding of this universe, which is not gross matter the way we thought about it in the 19th century but, uh, or in antiquity, but it is this unbelievably complicated, mysterious quantum world of the strangest of, of the strange. And we are a special transient moment in that because unless we can find some way to escape from this planet before it goes up in smoke. Uh, but even then, we won't be able to escape from the fate of the universe, of this universe. Now, maybe that there are multiple universes, in which case the universe, reality will keep going, but we, we won't. Now, um, so, so, in, when, when, we, when we turn to us, and so the first two parts of the existence of God are um, consciously and intentionally uh, um, anthropocentric, turned to us. The name of God name, uh, occurs in tandem with us. It, it is the name we give to something that has uh, haunted us, transformed us, or not. It is. Uh, it follows us down the labyrinthine corridors. You know. It's it's the name in which we name our desire beyond desire, and that belongs, it seems to me, to our form of life to what Heidegger calls a mode of being in the world, or Wittgenstein calls a form of life. It belongs to uh, a mode of dwelling, later Heidegger, in the world. But it appears to be transient. It appears to be time-bound. It appears to be a moment where the universe sort of... Uh, grew arms and legs and a head and started asking, who am I and what am I? And then, as Nietzsche says, the universe drew another breath and moved on. Now, I do not find that defeating, depressive, demoralizing, disenchanting, I think it is integral to and constitutive of the preciousness of this fleeting cosmic moment, which is us and this globe of ours, this moment of blue, white glimmering in the Copernican skies. Like, and this is my best example, because you will like it because it has to do with love. <laughs> <laughs> like lovers in the night who cling even more tightly to one another, knowing that in the morning they must part. It's the finitude, the temporality, that constitutes the preciousness of life. Intrinsically, constitutes it. And just the way that Levinas says, the, uh, our inability to read the minds of others, you know, to get inside their heads and know what they're thinking, is not a, a lack. 
it's constitutive of the mystery of the other. And I think the finitude of our existence is constitutive of our lives, intrinsically constitutive of what we mean by love, and makes life a more precious grace. And I think the notion of God belongs inside that event. And in that, in, in that sense, perhaps is older than God. Older than us, older than the earth. So I don't think you need to live forever in order to love, or that you need something has to last forever in order to love it. I don't think love implies eternity. I think uh, the opposite is the case. I think temporality engenders love. It's the, the preciousness of uh, what we know is eventive, eventual, that constitutes it. Life and love. But I do agree, I was wrong, and I admitted it, and I admitted it for the first time in ICS, when I did make it sound like the neutral, the anonymous, is the thing in itself, and the rest is subjective. I, I, don't, I don't think that at all. I think the universe is Paul Tillich, actually. If you would like to read a, the a theologian who is actually an accredited theologian and not a rogue, renegade philosopher who wandered off the reservation, um, um, read Tillich. And Tillich is addressed to, he's talking, somebody asked him a question about prayer. And they say, how can you pray to the ground of being? If the ground of being is not somebody, how can you pray to that? And he says, well, the ground of being is the ground of persons as well. It's not that it is less than persons, it is the deep root from which persons emerge. And so when I said the uter can be uterine, I was thinking of you directly, but it now occurs to me that that's a good Tillichian answer as well. That the ground of being expresses itself for him in, in all the various forms of uh, cultural life not just in religion, and um, in particular things, and in persons uh, who are personal relative to what sounds like the impersonal ground of being. So the, the ground of being is not impersonal, but it's the pre-personal ground of which persons is, are an emergent uh, property. So, I don't want to say that some impersonal... Now, there's a, there's a new version of this argument that discussion that Jim and I are having, that just, you'll, when you get to the end of the insistence of God, you'll see a whole new round of French philosophers, young bucks, uh, who are not my problem because I'm retired. You know, they're, they let the young guys deal with this one. Uh, who are reacting against continental philosophy, arguing that it's subjectivistic, and they press for what they call a, a realist position. They call it speculative realism, and there's one in particular who is quite a good writer named Ray Brassier, who does this sort of uh, Nietzschean routine about the... Uh, except he doesn't even like Nietzsche, because he thinks Nietzsche is too sexy, you know, too much affectivity in Nietzsche. Uh, about the, the universe in a trillion, trillion years from now will be just entropic dissipation. And he thinks that makes nonsense of religion and really even the humanities, I think. You know, I mean, he teaches philosophy, but I think he just thinks we are really just uh, very, very complex neurophysiological uh, systems that we haven't quite figured out yet, but we're on the way to figuring it out. And uh, the universe is, you know, we're getting a good, pretty good handle on what that is, too. And so religion and life world and phenomenology and poetry and all that is really uh, ultimately a matter of science. And that has taken hold in uh, France. Uh, so there's a whole new, it, it's a student of Badieu. This guy Badieu is a colleague of Zizek. Uh, 
a young man named, a younger man, he's in his 40s now, uh, named Maila Suf. So that argument's all, uh, has recurred. To where I came in, it's like I watched a movie, you know, and I came in late and I sat to watch the, the part I missed. My lasso is where I came in. When, in. Back in the 60s, all the phenomenologists were amassing phenomenological reductions to offset uh, uh, scientific realism, you know, and then it went away until this came back. <laughs> so it's where I came in. Um, but in any case, so, so this argument that Jim and I have been having is now getting rehearsed again. And so I respond to Brassier in the way that I just responded to Jim. I don't think any of that shows anything, does anything to detract from or demean or undermine the, our form of life. Religion is a form of life for me. It's, it's like poetry. It's like... Uh, It's like history, it's like culture, it's like art. It's a, it's a form of life. It's a way of making contact with the, what Tillich would call the grand being, the depths, the depths of our reality. And that it is finite and will pass. As Derrida would say, so what? <laughs> so what? So I mean, what? So... So what about uh, the chance of grace and the, gra and the uh, grace of chance? And yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's possible. <laughs> I, I, I mean, there is absolutely the case, you know, that I cannot go around saying things are absolutely not going to happen or happen. I just, I, I just, I mean, frankly. Uh, but my my thought of that is well, think about it. You know, does this seem somewhat more likely that? I mean, we now. I mean, I would say most people look back at the New Testament. People who do New Testament research and say, well, you know, I mean, there was this story of Jesus resurrecting Lazarus was uh, uh, the. The, the telling of some Greek-speaking Gentile who never laid eyes on Jesus and who wrote the story 60 years after he was dead in a world where communication systems were not too advanced. Uh, and he's the only one in the New Testament who seems to know that story. Um, and, and you say, well, actually, a lot of the things that are in the New Testament are like that. And, but behind that is the figure of someone who changed everybody who came in contact with him, a genuine living human being who was a healer and an exorcist and a teller of perplexing stories. And he wasn't the only one, but he was the one that made a difference. And there was something going on there. It's, most of it's lost in the fog of history. And it's preserved in memories that are distorting him because they're trying to make him the creator of this new thing called Christianity and uproot his Jewishness, make his Jewishness the enemy that he was fighting, which he would have found amusing almost as amusing as Miriam of Nazareth would have found the story of the virgin birth. It would have taken, I, I think, taken her some time to regain her composure upon hearing that story. And she just wouldn't be able, couldn't, couldn't wait till she got home to tell that story to the father of Jesus. So there's somebody back there, some powerful impulse in which an event cluster of events took place, which had to do with peace and forgiveness and mercy and all the things that cluster around this idea of the kingdom of God. And that is what it is. It doesn't have to be tur turned into a great cosmic salvation history. Its, it's beauty is intrinsic and finite and powerful and everlasting Ever, everlasting meaning uh, 
How could we ever do without that? Anyone want to get in on this from the class or from outside uh, visitors in, inside the room? <laughs> um, we can pick this up later. It's a controversial point. <laughs> Flora? It seems, to, it seems to me that um, you, you talk a lot about uh, the impossible in your books yeah. and, um, and how the impossible can crack us open and surprise us. But it also seems that for you, the impossible has limits and that this is a particular limit that, you know, well, of course, no one can rise again from the dead. And so, of course, Lazarus, or of course, Christ didn't. So this must be a very nice story. Um, so that is an impossibility. Uh, that, that, that's a limit. Um, how would you respond to that? Is that Yeah, I, I'm trying to, to capture, formulate, the logic of the, the impossible, which is the, the horizon-shattering moment. But the very first... And, and that's why Derrida calls it the impossible, uh, meaning not a logical impossibility, but uh, a phenomenal, a phenomenological one. The impossible. Um, but the very first thing that Derrida did was uh, engage in the debate with Levinas. Brilliant analysis of Levinas has really put Levinas on the map, I think and deeply influenced Levin, uh, Derrida in return. Um, so that Derrida never was the same after that, I think. Uh, I think Derrida grew up, when you were there yesterday, uh, I think he grew up as a very secular Jewish kid who had no time for religion, or this, this being, being, being religious Jew, and who was interested in the girls. If you read his biography, uh, <laughs> He was from an early, very early on, into age one, interested in the girls. And he learned enough Hebrew to get himself through bar mitzvah, and then he went to Paris and forgot the whole thing. And um, met even more girls. And then he met Levinas. And Levinas uh, spelled out in an extraordinarily powerful way what you might call the sort of phenomenology of his Jewishness, you know, the phenomenology of neighbor love, and the phenomenology of this inbreaking, and I think it permanently altered Derrida. But Derrida said, uh, in return to, in addition to offering an extremely appreciative analysis, he said, he said, "Now look, this holy other can't be holy, holy other. You know, if it was holy other." In as si simply holy other, it would just go right by us. It wouldn't, doesn't make any sense. Things that are holy other are holy other than. Right? And so they have to be holy other than something. So you have relative alter alterabilities. So you can alter things inside horizons and refine them and fine tune them. And then you can have situations where the horizon itself is, is altered. Which you also see in the history of science when some anomaly occurs which causes science to shift in a fundamental way. But it doesn't shift in so, so fundamental a way that it's not science anymore. It's, it's just a fundamental shift, a change in what Heidegger calls Grundbegriffs. So he says, when Levinas talks about the holy other, he means other persons. So it's the holy other has to be the same as me, it has to be another person. And he says that the holy other comes to me in the bonjour, when I pass someone in the corridor, and instead of just treating them as a as a picture picture hanging on the wall, I say bonjour, and I was, and he says that I'm bowing to their infinity. So it comes to me in the person to person, and it comes to me in language. So the holy other is holy other inside a, a very fixed horizon, right? It's an interruption, a, sh a, a powerful interruption of, a, of, a, of an existing frame of reference. If it weren't, 
it, it wouldn't be anything. We wouldn't recognize it. I mean, if, were, if you said, if you wanted a wholly other word, we wouldn't recognize it to be a word. You know, we wouldn't hear it. We wouldn't know it's a word. So, the impossible is, is always relative to the horizon of expectation. Now, I th- and I think that the logic of the impossible is always, it's like that. It is, it is these transforming changes that, that reconfigure things in politics, revolutions, in science, revolutionary changes, um, in, in social history, radical alterations of the relationships between, between the inside and the outside and the privileged and the underprivileged. Um, now, could it be, could the impossible be anything that is not logically contradictory in itself? Well, yeah. It could. And I would never say that I have no reason to believe that this is what, what a, an afterlife, an eternal love, eternal resurrection is not going to happen. I just think that it is a it's not the best reading. I, I, I think that I think that what's going on in in these in religious texts are uh, probings, deep probings of the human condition, that are telling us things about ourselves that are uh, discomfort us and demand challenge us and uh, ask for transformation. Um, But the metaphysics of Neoplatonism in which Christianity inserts the, the parables of Jesus, maybe it's true. I, you know, I, I can't show you that it's not, but it's, uh, it, it does not seem to me the most plausible uh, way to understand the transforma- the new being, what Paul calls the new being. But it is not logically, it's not, it's not a square circle. I think it's, I just think it's, I think it's Christian Neoplatonism. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, I mean, what Jesus and the, as far as we know, what the, the last two centuries of Judaism in which Jesus was lived, um, belong, Jesus belonged to the Pharisaic tradition, which thought that there was a, a resurrection. And the rest of the Jews did not. And in either in either case, whether which one you're talking about, they were talking about uh, God coming to establish His rule on Earth, here, in, in this little planet. And um, those damn Romans are going to get their comeuppance, and it's going to be God's imperial rule, not not Caesar's. And that's what they thought. And they didn't have an idea of the immortality of the soul, and they didn't have an idea of eternity. They had an idea of the resurrection of the body. When G- and they didn't even think that people were going to die before Jesus came back. The Christians didn't think Jesus, they were going to die before Jesus came back. The Jews didn't accept Jesus. And they had a good reason for not accepting Jesus. They said, what's different? You know, Rome is still here. Uh, we're, we're still starving. What's different? The, the Messiah has arrived and nothing changed. In fact, it got worse in the year 70. The temple was destroyed. The Messiah, if the Messiah has been here, he didn't, he better, he better come back because he didn't do anything. He didn't change anything. Evil persists and the Romans are still here and what's different? So, so what they, you know, they, they had a sort of, uh, they had a view about the God's coming and restoring the kingdom of uh, justice and peace in the Messianic age, on Earth. I didn't know anything about 500,000 years from now, I wasn't going to be in the Earth. And they didn't know any of that. And I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it has to do with the intrinsic heart of the kingdom of God, which has to do with forgiveness and mercy and justice. Ministering to someone who is dying. And then they die. And they're not heard from again. Except in their books. Or in their memory. So, so maybe you want to agree with this, but let me throw something to you. Um, So in 300 and 400 years, 
um, so if we had a recording of this, which I, apparently we do, and then these people had access to it or something. Um, it seems to me from the, from if the history of ideas tells the same thing, one part of what you're doing is going to be laughed at. Like, oh, that was silly, how that cute little... It's 20, 21st century science. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but one part of that, if they, if they understand the problem, is not going to be laughed at because it's still going to be a problem. Namely, problems about what a human being is. Right. Uh, you know, how do we think about the meaning of one and many, these like fundamental concepts. Right. So it seems like what religion is, or whatever it is that it, what, you used to call your work philosophical theology, philosophy, theology, I don't know. But, I don't know. But, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever that is, uh, if you look at the history of ideas, it seems like that's, that's what has staying power. Why, why, why do we invest so much authority in, you know, these scientific narratives that are probably going to be, like, laughed off, you know? Well, because there's always a scientific narrative shaping what you're saying. And that was, it's not like we have a scientific point of view and the people in the New Testament didn't. People in the New Testament did have a scientific view and it was, you know, faulty. Sure. Right? So the, 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 cosm the cosmological view, the cosmic view, the view of the... Of the big picture is always there, and they had one. And they, they, the things that they had to say in the New Testament are embedded in that view. Right? I mean, there were there were powers and principalities and bad, evil spirits that were battling with the the, the spirit, the angels, of God, and uh, they they made people sick. They got inside their bodies. Um, and it was this arch over the earth, and it was the the heavens beyond the heavens, over that arch, and they had a comprehensive world view, which affected everything that was said in the New Testament, and it turned out to be, as you said, we smile at it now. So, what, and what matters is the core of what was going on then. Um, which was the problem they had then, and the problem we'll have now, and the people 400 years from now uh, will have, will continue to have. And what's that? Although I have my, my one, I, I wonder about 400 years from now if we get that far, um, because we will have, we have, we will have begun to gain the power to detach conscious life from its corporeal base. It's, it's, it's flesh-based existence by more and more and more and more uh, technological enhancement and substitution for bodily uh, faculties, organs, uh, and maybe they'll figure out just what they're trying to figure out, and they're working very hard on it, which is how to detach consciousness from its corporeal base altogether. So you may have a situation, a po what, what, the debate that's going on now called post-humanism. I mentioned it at the end of the, 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 uh, the insistence of God, the, the debate about post-humanism. Well, you really would not be human anymore you, because you would have basically detached yourself from uh, a flesh-based based life. But let, let's prescind from that. 400 years is actually a lot in the his, given the, hit of the history of technological change. And they, they might just do it by then. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, so it's the things that are the, st the, the things that we're asking ourselves now within the framework of the 21st century that are also being discussed back in a very simple, simple minded cosmology from 2,000 years ago. Well, we see some pretty simple-minded things now, right? We do. <laughs> I mean, if you want, it's if the you history want to of science. understand some philosophical problems, you should probably go to Plato, not us. <laughs> Plato would be the worst possible place to go. <laughs> you, you do want to go back to the Greeks, but I would go to Aristotle. Plato's the beginning of all the trouble. Plato's the beginning of all this dualism and eternal life and detaching the soul from the body and all that. And he, and he got into the heart of Christianity through the fourth gospel. And in the early 
first three centuries of Christian Neoplatonism. But I agree, the heart of that, the heart of the New Testament, the heart of what we're concerned with right now, and the heart of whatever, if we're still in a recognizably human form 400 years from now, are these problems of how we live with one another and how we love and how we deal with hate and exclusion and mercilessness and violence, all those things. Yeah, that's the core of our, our form of life. I just want you to get rid of the Neoplatonism. Okay, TJ, you want to? Yeah, follow up on that. Uh, you talk in a number of places about being haunted by Nietzsche and about also orthodox theology being haunted by radical theology. And I, I wonder, would, as you, you presented here today, it doesn't sound as much like a, a haunting as, a, come on, think about it. This is, this is the best uh, account we have of the way things are. And I, I wonder, sort of the reverse, are you, when, when you talk about Mary and Martha and resurrection, it's snake oil, it's magic, it's, you, you can see the gem, there might be a new heaven and a new earth, but it, it seems almost like you wish there, there wouldn't be. And as you talk about love and the importance of um, transience and finitude, it's like love couldn't be lasting because it wouldn't, wouldn't be love. It, it's, it seems to be as good. So in, in all that, I guess I'm wondering, are, are you haunted by uh, haunted by resurrection? Was, was there a time in your life when, when you were? Uh, and oh yeah, and can you tell us about that? <laughs> oh yeah, well I mean I'm a third generation Italian Catholic and uh, grew up in pre-Vatican II world. Is he is he loud enough, or is it just my ears? Oh okay, maybe I'm not being loud enough. Can you hear me back here? Could you hear it? Yeah, I mean I grew up with. Oh good. I, I do. I talk. I give a lot of talks to to sort of re, to to. to um, uh, pro progressive, welcoming community churches, you know, and they're uh, they're uh, uh, all people in these places. These people invite me anyway. The people who are willing to listen to me. They're all very progressive places, and uh, they're they're recovering. I call me recovering evangelicals. You know, they're overcoming this horrendous uh, uh, childhood in you know, fundamentalism. And, uh, and but they don't want to throw away the whole the baby with the water, and I understand exactly what their problem is, without ever having for one second been tempted by fu biblical fundamentalism. I mean, the problem with Catholic is they don't read the Bible at all. <laughs> so you know, we are singularly in insulated from uh, biblical fundamentalism. <laughs> Um, but I do understand the problem because I had the counterpart in uh, Vatican authoritarianism. So I lived in a world, I grew up in a world, where there was an absolute truth and it was well defined. And if you departed from it, you, you would regret it uh, for eternity. Right? And I, I lived in... Uh, with the love of Jesus with my right hand and the fear of hell with my left hand. Timor Costos and Timor uh, Servilis, Augustine calls it. The, the chaste or holy fear of, uh, of uh, losing the love of God and the, and the servile fear of being punished. Um, so I, under, and I understand uh, all that stuff perfectly, except it's biblical fundamentalism, not Vatican authoritarianism. It's the Pope or the paper Pope. I get it. And I take, uh, and, and so I lived in under Pius XII. I was educated in, all the way through high school under Pius XII. And then Vatican II came along, and when Vatican II came along, it opened the, the windows. The joke is it opened the windows and everybody jumped out. Um, and I was in the religious life. In, in Vatican II, during Vatican II. I spent four years as a uh, member of the Brothers of the Christian Schools, and I wrote the Dallas, what they call the De La Salle Brothers. And I spent 15 months in a novitiate 
uh, where we were silent all day long. And uh, we had Thursday afternoon, it was a French order, so we had Thursday afternoon and Sunday afternoon big re recreation, and we could talk and play football or something. And then back to silence and prayer and work and study and prayer and work and study and meals while someone read from uh, a spiritual reading while you were eating in silence. So I lived, so I lived in what was, except for the fact that we had electricity and indoor plumbing, a 13th century monastery, getting 13th century theology, the whole, the whole thing, and 13th century liturgy, and you know, maybe not the 13th century, the Council of Trent anyway. And, you know, in the same way that there are recovering evangelicals, I'm, rec I'm a recovering Catholic, you know, and, uh, and like them, I don't want to throw the water out with the baby out with the water. I think that there's something going on in the figure of Jesus and the kingdom of God and the, and the Jewish scriptures. And uh, I, I, my, my understanding of it is, in, in, is sharpened and fixed and focused by phenomenology and hermeneutics and deconstruction which it seems to me recaptures that that form of life and what's, and what's going on in that form of life the event that solicits us in that form of life and uh, I, I don't uh, I, I mean I probably have given you the pressure that I think that uh, I, I think the literal interpretation of the story of Lazarus is, is, is really is magic I actually don't think that that's, that that's what that was. I think it is literature. I think it's uh, poetry. I think it is a gospel, is a song, a hymn of praise, which is not meant to be transliterated. It is not meant to be taken in any, in any literal sense. It's a, it's a song of praise to the event that takes place in and under the name of Jesus of which the memory is preserved in the church. And so I say the church is haunted by this memory, and uh, confessional theologies are haunted. See, I think that if you wake up in the middle of the night with a start and think about what just woke you up, you'll hear the insistence of God in my sense. That this is... Uh, an appeal that appeals to us to love without why. One of the heresies that the church condemned was the heresies of the medieval women, the Frauen Mystik, the, the women mystics in the 13th century, from whom Meister Eckhart got this line, love is without why. And, and they meant it. Love is without why. It doesn't, you don't get eternal rewards for loving, and you don't get eternal punishments for not loving. If that were a marriage, we'd call it a spousal abuse. Right? But love is without why. It is a, a moment of shining beauty, which is loved, expended, enacted for the sake of enacting it, for the love itself, for, for the beloved. Without why. It doesn't have anything to do with an economy. It's not, it's not supposed to be everlasting. It has nothing to do with being everlasting. It has to do with you know, giving a cup of cold water. And, and, and I think the more literal versions of Christianity that, you, that literalize the New Testament give us a, a fundamentally fantastic uh, uh, view of things. That um, it's, it is not preaching. When I go to these churches, you know, I'll talk to these people and they'll say, well, I went to one, or the guy was Jewish. And I said, I, I'm all for Jesus the Jew, but what are you doing here? I mean, I, I don't get it. I mean, this is the, you know, the such and such Presbyterian church. I mean, what are you doing? He says, these are great people, and this community is beautiful, and the work we do for the wider community is just fantastic. And he says, this is, the, this is the kingdom of God for me. And I said, that's it. One of my, I saw one of my friends uh, who was still in the Christian Brothers. In that he could do, but most of them did really jump out the window. Um, there's only four left, there were 46 of us, and only four are left. And he said to me, uh, 
He says, Jack, uh, you know, I'm a, I went to a reunion, a high school reunion, because we went to the same high school. And he said, uh, he says, you know, I'm a lapsed Catholic. And I said, uh, and he's still a Christ, Christian brother. And I said, how does that work? <laughs> and he said, um, he said, well, you know, I do what I'm supposed to do. I, I go to Mass on Sunday and I get the, I do, I keep the rules of the order and uh, I, I do everything I'm supposed to do. He said, but I, I don't actually think any of that is true anymore. I said, well, what are you doing here? And he says, he works in uh, a, a, a place run by the Christian Brothers, but it's sponsored by the city of Philadelphia, um, which is for delinquent children who are bad. The kids who have really had bad lives. You know, they don't know who their mother is or that they do. She's in jail and they never met their father and just lives that you can't, we can't imagine what, what they've, how they've grown up. And they've ended up in trouble with the law. And instead of putting them in uh, uh, the, the system, they put them in this Catholic uh, re uh, reform school. And he said, there's my vocation. Those kids, that's what I'm doing here. That's what I do. He said, I don't, I don't, I'm a lapsed Catholic, but that's my work. That's my religious life. And I said to him, I'm not going to argue with a word of that. I think you've got it right. I think that's exactly right. Should we take a moment to uh, have a little break and... Uh Come back in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, something like that. Is that good? Makes sense?